belief system, there's a false sense of responsibilities in the sense that the mind makes up a, a world of illusions and then gets wound into those duties, obligations, responsibilities. And then eternal peace seems like too big of a price. <laughs> you know, it's too big of a price to let go of those things. So in other words, what you're really calling for is you're saying, okay, I'm convinced that I have some guilt around some responsibilities and duties. And I need to be shown the impossibility of that. I need to be shown that, that there's no sacrifice involved in this. That me following my highest good for everyone, everything, doesn't, require, doesn't involve loss. Because as long as I believe that there's some loss involved in doing God's will, then it won't matter what I'm doing. It's going to be some guilt and some shame that's involved in that. So those are great quotes from the Bible about, you know, who is my father, mother, sister, brother, he that does the will of my father in heaven is my father, my sister, brother. Um, the ego is involving past associations, and I, I use this metaphor a lot, I call it like the 52 card pickup, where I, you know, I see that, that the ego dealt out all of the experiences, my, the relationships, mother, father, the very ones we're talking about, you know, you go all the way around and all the uh, contacts and people you've had in your life, and there was guilt in all of them because of who the dealer was. That the that the, the ego wanted us to displace the guilt of thinking you separated from God and put a little bit, hide a little bit of guilt in each relationship. And then when you start to let them go, this, the guilt starts coming up. Like, wait a minute, I don't want to harm somebody. I don't want to. I don't want to follow my joy and then bring harm and misery to them still implying that following joy and following God's will could bring harm to anyone, you know? Especially when they're telling you that you are. Yeah. <laughs> 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 there, goes. Yeah, there goes Lisa's. And that's the truth. For, I have two teenagers. I have 17 and 16. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you something. What I did, and I told you this, I think, at that other gathering was, mm -hmm. you know, I just felt this pulling. And I really just felt I had no other choice. And I was really in such a state of joy. And my family saw it too. My family saw this change in me. That I was just really so full of peace and joy. And, um, and I had guilt. And I'm not, there's still a little guilt there. Okay? But it, it seems to all take care of itself. Like the one time when I was leaving, and I was leaving for 11 days and telling them I'm coming back and I'm leaving for 11 days, you know, there were four days there that I was in this total bliss. Well, I told you, I closed my eyes and it was like light and nothing was letting me have any doubt and I was staying in the joy and I was staying and they were all like, I can't believe you're doing this, da 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 They were thinking I was joining a cult, you know. I told my son he could quit school and come with me. Then they really thought I lost. <laughs> they, really, they took me out to dinner and they had like a, they did like a psychoanalysis. <laughs> yeah, they were like, yeah, for that shit. You know, they, they, they looked at me and said, now you really believe that Polly should quit school? Yes, I do. I do think that if he should come with me, I said, it's meaningless. And they said, how can you say that uh, having not having an education is, you know, meaningless? Hey, I didn't graduate from high school, I told them. I said, do I look like I'm doing pretty good, you know, in my life? And I said, I'm following my joy. And that's what I want to teach my family to do, too. Follow your joy. Don't do something that you don't want to do. And um, I tried, to, I went back and I tried to do it. And they, my daughter, this last time, and she's 17, she said, you must go. You must go. And the other trip, they were all saying, Go and it seems like everything seems to be provided for. At first, it's very, very. It's shaken the whole picture, and it's Fear. changed. Fear. Yeah, it's changed. It's shaken the whole boat, and it's given up our concepts of, like that's what I learned from those states. Our concepts of what a mother's supposed to be, our concepts of what a daughter and a son and the relationship is supposed to be, and what is really important is being in joy, and by, it's sharing joy too. It's sharing, it's sharing, being in joy, you know, living in joy. And they're all invited to come. I've not said that I'm, I don't want you to come, I want you all to come with me. They're choosing not to come. So, and is, that's part of the script, maybe that's just part of the script. Whatever. It's supposed to be. Whatever. 
But our responsibility is to live in the now, whatever that now is for us, and that script is still going to go on. Yes. They're being provided for. And to see, my uh, boyfriend just won't, I try to end that relationship. He's staying there with him. Yeah. <laughs> thinking that I'm the worst mother in the whole wide world. <laughs> you know, I can't believe you're doing this. I cannot believe that you're... Sure, you I probably can't believe he's finally doing something productive for you. Well... <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> heard doing all kinds of stuff and now they never did. Yeah. Not in the vacuum, doing a wash, mom is there to the wash. Right. Yeah. She was always here. Yeah. I was and you know what it makes them appreciate me when I come home. It's done, done something like miraculous to my whole life. They appreciate it's the whole family coming together and seeing what mom did. So I come now and I'm more grateful too because I don't even have to say to help help me. My daughter's I come home, she's doing two loads of wash. You know, and that is really beautiful. It's all of us, you know, kind of being together and and joining in the same purpose. And it it's me. Hey, it's not me and happy and nobody going to be happy. So, yeah. You know, so I'm going to follow what makes me happy. And if it seems to look like I'm being removed, I'm not removed. You know, we're one and um, <clears throat> that I call, they hear my joy. They, you know, they're, everything's provided. And that's, I'm walking in trust. And that's peace. And what it looks like out on the script to the world. I, I'm not worrying about it anymore. It's, it's much easier when, when the society has labeled you as mentally ill. I've been in the middle of hospital, it's like, hey, I'm just crazy. Okay, no problem. <laughs> you know, just give me a lot more freedom. <laughs> What are you doing now? I'm buying a five hundred dollar, you know, PA system. I might have been asking that to one. Okay, no problem. You're crazy. <laughs> God's gonna use it. Uh, so I'm just supposed to be the go between now. You know. Okay. <laughs> it gives you a lot more for you. <laughs> did, did, you get your, did you get your question answered? Uh, yes. You know, in the in the, in the book. I would read the camera project. It says this, and I quote it all the time to other people that I'm talking to. And it says, if I have any fear whatsoever, any form of fear, doesn't matter. All I have to do is say to myself, I don't know what anything, including this, means. So how if I don't know what it means, how do I know how to respond to it? And I refuse to use the, lear the learning of my, my past learning as a light to guide me now. And then it says that the guide that God has given you will speak to you. And I, and, and, and I literally believe that. You don't know that I have the past control your future. Do what? You don't let the past control your future. Because I don't know. No, I don't let... I, I say I don't know what anything, including this, means. I don't know. Including the present. The pre anything. I know nothing. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Isn't it? Am I right? You'd be a happy camper. <laughs> because you just allow an openness for the spirit to I know nothing because it's all made up. It, it doesn't exist. Your past doesn't exist. I know nothing. So, if I know nothing, how can I respond to this thing that, I, that, that I'm that i finding? I don't know how to respond to it because I don't know what it means, including anything else. So, I'm not going to use my past learning, which is all wrong. All wrong. Because it says we have to unlearn everything we know. All right? This yeah, is and, and so if I don't know anything, I can't use that thing that I don't know to guide me into now as a light to, to, to show the, me the way. That's the whole thing summarized. But what, what can guide me, and only the only thing that can guide me is the Holy Spirit. And He will speak to me. That's what the book said. Jesus said it, and it was a direct letter to me in the first person. And so, when I'm fearful about anything, I say this. I don't know what anything means. I mean, something comes up and, 
It happens all the time. Then I, I got to be in fearful a little bit. And then, oh, uh-huh. I don't know what this... I say it literally. I say it out just like it says. Say to yourself. I, and I call that my little willingness. Do I preach that to you? Mm-hmm. And anybody else that will listen two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 20 minutes. <laughs> but anyway, and I'll, he will speak to me and then he'll tell me, guide me. I do not know. I cannot do. I cannot do it. I, my own intelligence is useless. And I can't analyze it and get it. All I got to do is say, and you refuse to use that, and then the guy that God has given me will speak to me. And I think that's the point that I've been trying to get to all my life. Where this guide that God has given me will speak to me and I don't have to make those decisions because it says I can't. I can't do it. It's impossible. That's the reason He, God, the minute we had the tiny mind out idea, God created the Holy Spirit that instant, fixed it all, never missed a beat. He didn't create a woman to tell you what to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the way I believe. <laughs> That it all was fixed before there ever was a note missed in heaven's song. And it's over, it's done. Yeah, and you know what this does is it's like, for people that work or look at the Course and they'll just say, or, or even living in the moment, they say, if, if there were no rules, if there were no prisons, if there were no structures, you know, all hell would break loose, you know, and kind of assuming that this is already in the <laughs> But, you know, it's assuming that, and, and it's like, and if there was no judgment, then all would be chaos. And what it is, is no, without judgment, all is love, because all is now. And it takes a lot of faith to just open and surrender into that now moment, with full faith and confidence in the perfection of it. I've had, like, recently we were, I was in Oklahoma, and this woman, you know, she had two daughters that she had raised a little bit that were a little bit older, but they were kind of, she thought, were fairly well behaved, not a lot of energy, and, and a two-year-old who was like this little tyrant, he was spewing stuff all over, climbing on top of the counter, teetling around, and, and just, just, she said, he's like a tornado of energy, and she says, how do you practice A Course in Miracles when you've got a two-year-old loose? She said, I'm just always on edge. I'm always looking around. He's ready to fall off of something, this and that. And I said, what a gift of attentiveness. Because you don't need a little Zen master giving you, whipping you when you're, <laughs> when you're not off in meditation. And you've got, and I said, to flow in your intuitive moment where you're, you're listening inside. When, when you need to go over and, and swoop him off the top of the table as he's ready to <laughs> plummet head first or whatever, you, if you're in your moment, if you're living in that moment, that will be taken care of. But, but that's very different from using the past learning and fear to say, i got to stop him from doing this and stop him this and that and yell at him and control and, you know, this and that. It's a really high... I always ask, okay, what well, do I need to do? And while I have five kids, and I always did this, buy the best cartoon for them to sit down, there's a mystery of those uh, like learning things uh, for them to sit down and they do. I have a daughter, she had a little boy, and I can't control it, but then the best cartoons and that you can see and um, that they are in there and that boy sit down and watch. That is a learning uh, uh, cartoons uh, and it, it, it happens it's, it's no it's it's always an answer for it, anything for everything and it's an answer if we're willing to do yeah, to so do it mm-hmm. I might augment your wonderful movie list you need to have a movie list for kids yeah, <laughs> yeah. and also it's that thing, thing where you have to just let go of your expectations I tell the story sometimes where these two 
his parents are here. I want to leave you with my kids there. But I think it'll be a good experience for the week, and we want to fly off to someplace. So they were like fishing for my boundaries, kind of like we did when we were for substitutes, teachers, you know, how much can we get away with? They're like going, wow, whoa. And in the end, we, we had a wonderful week of just joy because it's a sense of inclusion and non-judgment and seeing the innocence. But in the end, at one point, they were got so giddy and, and so uh, into the joy that one of them, the youngest one, spit. And I watched it come and land. <laughs> and then, and then the, the, uh, his sister looked at him, and, and they both went. Because I didn't react. I just was continued smiling. And then a spit shower came. <laughs> that was a really good practice because when you're in the moment, you know, it's like all things work together for good. There's no exceptions, you know. It was a gleeful moment in which all this... <laughs> but it was just a good thing. And again, when you're in the moment, you aren't into the body identification. It was fun when I did a, a gathering recently um, because there was like, like 25 people and most of them were therapists. And they, I told that example and they said, Dave, that is not modeling helpful behavior. What if those kids then go home and they go to their siblings and whatever, you know. But we had been the whole, spent the whole week together in that joy and this and that. And I said, it's not modeled in terms of behavior. You have to start to remember everything is thought. And when you get to that point, the whole point is everything for your own lesson. To see, to not have any expectations. And to be in that state of, so some yogis like to go sit in cold chambers or with their little G-strings. I enjoy being with kids. <laughs> I, I got I got to But see, it was all part of the, the joy of the moment where you can see that, that all ego boundaries and rules that are made are, are made out of fear. That's where structure and rules come in, is, is saying, no, I, this is not appropriate, this is not acceptable. And love is, is a way of forgiving the whole world and, and just being in the joy of that moment. So it's well, You have to relate to linear time to tell that story, right? Yeah. And my, okay. my mother uh, is totally in the moment, because she doesn't remember what happened five minutes ago. <laughs> uh, I mean, I may remind her of something, and she'll remember. But I mean, literally five minutes ago, yeah. she may not remember. I'm, I'm still trying to get this how it is to you. You know that that you're not relating to linear time. Obviously, you are in some way because you tell of past experiences. So well, those are like parables. I can I can tell the experience, uh, and it's like. As I started to travel the country, the parables would come out and it would be like I was listening to the parables, but it was a feeling like it really wasn't about me. They were just used in a, in a helpful way as, it's just like Jesus, you know, there was a man who had two sons and prodigal son and all the different parables. Those are like little, little stories and illustrations that, that yeah, that point. But really, when it's like part of the joy of the moment is you really start to realize that you're not the story. You're that's the real freeing joy. No matter what the story seemed to be, who you are right now is is not the story, and that's where you lose the guilt. Because the guilt was taking things personally. You know, that's that perspective is where the the guilt came in. Could, could you talk about an issue that um, I'm facing with a friend? Would you talk about suicide? Yeah. Suicide, you know, is described as a decision to kill oneself, and, and yet um, all of life and death is defined in terms of form. So life, in terms of form definitions, begins at birth, and or however it's defined. In, in those kind of con terms. <laughs> Either <laughs> penal or not. Right, right. <laughs> whatever. Oh, whatever. The, somewhere around birth, <laughs> whatever that's described as, and ends around death. And suicide it seems to be like the taking of a life. Um, mm -hmm. So so suicide in those terms would seem different than, um, you know, being hit by a truck uh, or what the world would call accidents, where, you know, that something happens to you apart from your choice. You just happen to happens to be your your day is up, you know your your life is up. But actually, everything is a decision by the mind. So what I like to do is take it deeper and deeper to the point that your state of mind is either a reflection of life or death, in the sense that you're either joyful and peaceful and free and happy, which is your choice, 
That's that state of mind. Or you choose help. You choose. It doesn't matter whether you're irritated or annoyed or tired or fearful, or fearful angry. angry, guilty, you know, jealous. All those emotions. <coughs> so really, every moment is like a life or death situation or a life or death opportunity. To choose life, to choose the joy of being in the moment, or to try to live in the past, which is where all those emotions come up, still trying to hang on to the linear thing. So you see how it lifts the whole definition out, out of a form sense, like suicide, to, you know, there's a part in the Course where he says, swear not to die, you holy son of God. <laughs> He's just saying, choose life. you know. Like the billboards say, choose life, except this is, is not talking <laughs> about a, a fetus. This is talking about your state of mind, that you have the power to choose life at any any moment. So it takes this, the whole thing about suicide out as if, uh, you know, um, life and death then are not seen in terms of form. Like I worked for hospice, and there, they would call me into the rooms when I would walk along there, and whatever they were incoherent or whatever, they would get very coherent when I would walk in the room and they asked me all these meaning of life questions and I would say, it's okay, you don't have to worry about um, your parents or your children or whatever and it's okay to go to the light and I was just, it was like a reflection of giving them permission, go back to the present moment, to the eternal moment. And then the next day I'd come in and oh, so-and-so checked out, so-and-so. I had a high checkout rate, <laughs> which, you know, from the worldly terms, you know, death is, is not good. You want to save lives and prolong lives mm -hmm. if you see it in terms of form, but when you get into content or mind, it's all just choose the present moment, choose forgiveness, choose freedom. Don't choose, you know, grievances and hanging on to the past and people-pleasing and all that stuff. I got a question. What is the difference in what you're telling us between monkness? In other words, you're you're kind of like a traveling monk in America. You don't have the Buddhist robes, but you're doing the Buddhist monk thing here in a way. And, and being a householder, do you see that as also an alternative course? Well, the script is written, so I feel like everything and everyone is always a perfect reflection of your mind, and everything then equally gives you the same opportunity, you know, to choose life. Because if you seem to do the monk thing, or let's say you go off and you're in a community, or you're even more secluded off in the Himalayas somewhere doing hours of meditation, it's still letting go of past and future thoughts. No different than if you seem to be a householder and you've got kids running around or whatever, you still are, it's the same thing. You're going to have to release past and future thoughts. And actually, you know, relationships in this world are... Um, not something to be avoided in the sense that they are like mirrors. So when people say, well, I have children or I have um, people that I live with and there's a group of us, whether it's a community or a family or whatever, those are reflectors of what your mind believes. And I always say you should be grateful for that because there's an unconscious mind where a lot of stuff has been stuffed down. And these people just act out those grievances and concepts and, and limitations that you still believe are real and true and give you a chance to, that's like flushing it into your awareness. If somebody's acting it out right in your face, which is the way it is with relationships and sometimes with children, you know, it's like so much in your face that it's just a speed up. It's part of a speed up of seeing what you believe. The mirroring occurs at a, at a mind level, so when people say things to me like, well, I don't get this mirroring stuff, you know, I'm, I'm neat and tidy and organized, and my roommate is lazy and sloppy <laughs> and messy, and there's no mirroring going on. Clean, messy. <laughs> That's a fact. Clean, messy. And I say, no, it's like you have to believe in the concepts of lazy and dirty and whatever, before you can even perceive them, you have to believe them. They have to be concepts that are in your mind. But God didn't create lazy and dirty and sloppy. I've been in, it's like, it's like judging their roommate. I've been in places where the people, <clears throat> they crawl or watch me, and I go, no, the council, I go sit down and, and talk. And I concentrate in the mess. I mean, you're talking about food being for three weeks and then they stop. 
I don't concentrate in that. And um, and I've been there. And, but people start changing, just like that. They start changing. I don't talk about nothing. I'm a, I'm a, I treat him like I treat anybody. You know, no difference. And I, I see, I don't judge him, I don't pay attention to what's around there. And I noticed that not even a month or two, they bought a new toilet at home. They have a better job. You know, and I think because I believe that it's, it's a goodness in there, that it's okay. And I think people don't want to be judged for who they are. You know, they want to be accepted. And then they make the decision, you know, I'm okay. That is in my experience. Yeah, acceptance. Yeah, acceptance. Acceptance is the answer. Judgment is... Exactly. It never works. <laughs> you know, uh, I remember what you said last time I was there, and that remembrance helped me the next few days to take care of what I needed to take care of in my life. And so I think that we can be in the past where the past is, a, is, a, is helpful, like what, to remember what you said and so forth because then it transforms my present. But to uh, have things in the past that you don't want in the past that's actually hurting you, like an old wife that you divorced or something, all the things she did to you, that kind of stuff you should bury because that is not helpful. So I think we could... Does that make sense to you? Like we could, the I past is okay can bury for remembering. You can't well, bury it. You don't bury it, but you just let go of it, I guess. Think of it this way. That, I'm sorry. that the Holy Spirit in you can pull from the pool of the past. If the words seem to be used right now. Words are the past. You know, but we're in coming together and joining in the joy of this shared purpose to wake up, <laughs> to remember God, to remember ourself as love. The Spirit uses almost like you had a, like a pool where the Spirit could use in the Spirit. You know, in the Bible it says you know, let the Spirit of God put the words in your mouth if you're called before the courts of men and you know how old it is. That's what happens, that's the Spirit's use of the past. Or you just mentioned parables. Like how do you stay in the present with stories, you know? And, and when you stay in that state of consciousness with that desire to be helpful, again, with no clue of, of what that will be or how that will happen, then it's almost like the, the Spirit uses the symbols of the past and keeps pointing to the now with all the symbols. And maybe they are just stories. I mean, maybe... They really I, are. I, I remember <laughs> now, uh, one of my pastors said, what if you entered this life 30 seconds ago, complete with a past written on your brain, you know, I mean, but really, you're brand new, but you don't know it because you have a past printed... But I guess it really is like that, isn't it? Yeah, it really and is. And that's the stories you're telling from your past. It doesn't matter whether they ever happened. They're just metaphors for the now. Right. All right, I hear you. Well, you know, I talked to a hypnosis guy one time, and he says, we're all hypnotized, and we don't know it. And I says, really? And he says, yeah. And I think that the past uh, does hypnotize us. In other words, we take the form of the past and we become so enriched in this past and this, you know, of what has been taught to us and, and then programmed into us. And so we're like zombies sometimes. And I think mass consciousness, uh, people that never think about how they feel very much and just keep going all the time, uh, are in the way. It's kind of like watching TV and, and things are going around the house and you, you're, not, you're, you're on the TV. It, it's, you know, cops or something. You're getting arrested and all this bad stuff is happening to you. And, you know, you're going through that experience. And, and there's people, so many people like that running around outside that they're like watching TV and they don't know. Is that making sense? That's why it's so important to be so attentive and alert, you know, to your mind. Because hmm. if you're aware, awareness, awareness that's is yeah, that's, awareness. that's where you can stay in the moment. That's where the joy is, and then the mesmerism, the hypnotism hmm. of sleep, of forgetting it's a dream, of forgetting it's a movie, yeah. and getting all caught up. Just like when you would go to a movie theater, if you really were aware and you were in a state of bliss, you would just watch the movie and see that you're watching a movie. Hmm. But when you go into a theater and you forget that you're watching the movie and you get wrapped up with the characters, 
they yeah. identify. You identify with the characters, your heart starts pounding, and the emotions start flooding and everything. You're you're not thinking, I'm in a movie theater, I'm watching a movie. You're, you're right there, you're right on the screen, so to speak, in consciousness. And that's a, that's a wonderful metaphor for how the mind can forget that it's that it's watching something and get all wrapped up into the personal, you know, dramas. But it's, but it's escapism, though. Yeah. And it, they chose to escape. And that people do it watching soap operas because they want to escape from their own reality, which they don't enjoy. They'd rather watch somebody else's stuff than they're taking care of their own stuff. That's great that you can label it even as escapism because then you can see it's escapism. That it's just like a defense. And all I, I noticed that early on and I thought... I don't want to waste my time going to movies for that purpose. I want to be attentive when those emotions are coming up, and I really want to process this and really learn to forgive that there's... Uh, the, the whole Course teaches that, that what you perceive is what you believe. And the second lesson in the book is, I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. <coughs> so I would use that when I would go to the movies to say, okay, I'm choosing to this emotional roller coaster ride. This movie is not a happy movie. That movie didn't make me laugh. I'm laughing because of what I'm perceiving. That movie didn't depress me or make me sad. I'm happy or sad or depressed because of what's going on in my own perception. And then it gives you a lot of something to really go at, like a, to get the roots, to get down to the roots in your own mind instead of, like you said, the ego's escapism. It loves competition. It loves drama, murder mystery. That's what's going on with the reality shows. It's not really reality. <laughs> <laughs> they have a script. You're kidding. <laughs> and they can't stand in their own reality, so they have to go observe somebody else's reality. They don't like their life enough, and it's not interesting enough, so they find interest in other lives. That's what yeah, they do. This was saying, we need to film this. He said, we're having so much fun alone and all yeah. the miracles. Let's get a cameraman. And like, they do have, like, what's that girl's name? Anna Nicole Smith. You know, they have a lot of Well, now listen. Mm. That, but the truth is, is let's show them real joy. You know, and have it live, and let's follow it on the road. Real TV. Yeah, yeah. You know, real TV. You know, real people with real, real emotions. Real, real joy. Yes, real TV. Yes. You know, uh, let's show America what really, where the joy really is, in truth. It's not on television. Uh, well, uh, that's why I said, let's get a camera. Is that your next manifestation? Well, I'm not manifesting because I'm enjoying not doing it anymore. It's like a TV. She's not even attached to it. I'm not. I'm telling you, I'm not. Like, just not having to work my mind like that. Don't ask her about the future. Yeah, I'm just like in being. Yeah, I'm accepting my gift. Though. I'm accepting my gift that I no longer have to work at salvation. That I can just accept it now and be and accept my inheritance and uh, be in joy and be in love and that's it. And, and I don't have to do anything. I need to do nothing. Anything. That's right. Nothing. Out there. I need to do Here. nothing but be. There's nothing out there. And so that is the greatest Every, gift that everything I. Everything begins and ends in your mind. There's not a thing out there. <laughs> nothing not out there. Out there. Yeah. Nothing There's out nothing there. out there. <laughs> There's enlightenment. He wanted to definitely. Is there anything back there? It's all between you. Uh, well, I accept that. And, and a thing I learned one time, a really interesting thing, you know the longest journey you'll ever take? It's so about 18 inches from your head to your heart. Uh, yeah, I've heard it. You, you know something, we can say all this stuff now that there's no reality and everything. I, I just got through the course in American history. A hundred years ago, there was no machines. You know, I mean, there's no cars, no TVs, no boxes. People want to entertain. They play games. They they uh, went and looked at the stars and all this kind of stuff. And one of the problems we have is machines are controlling our lives. The TV sets, yes. watch me, you know, and all this stuff. Computer sets, play with me, you know. And, and we're all being pulled to these things, but we're not. But we're not creating anymore. They're, we're not creating. People are so lonely, and they're in these ticky tacky boxes. In our society now, we go, everything's a box. We, we live in a house, we drive a little boxy car, we go to a boxy office, and so forth. <laughs> and this breaks 
the thing. We're in, in a box, but there's lots of people in this box, and it's really different. From a, a lot of people live by themselves in this uh, society, and they're just so lonely, and they watch television all the time. It's just, you know, oh. that that gets me to. I was going to answer what he's relating to that. You were talking about movies and sitting outside or waiting inside the movie until you can process it. What did you get from the Matrix? Well, I. I just saw this is such a beautiful reflection of, of You Are the One, and of, I saw so much reflected in that movie that I had done the Movie Watcher's Guide and everything, and I, that was before it even it had come out, and I just thought, this is like, like a composite of everything. And so what happened about, I'd say between 10 and 15 people um, would contact me and say, I'm going to, I'm taking you to the movie The Matrix, and I'm going to sit in the back row of the theater. And I want you to give me a running commentary on all of it, because they sensed there was, it was so rich with symbols that they wanted to get just piece by piece in a two hour and some, some hour movie, just this and that. So I would have Christians who would come and I would let it come through in a Christian kind of <laughs> foundation and somebody who would be from another thing, I would let it come through. So each encounter was spontaneous. It would just, I would give it to them. And I, years ago I had students that, that one, they asked one of the students, did you see that movie, such and such a movie? And they said, no. He said, no, but um, but I did hear David's description of the movie, and it's better than the original. <laughs> and uh, Because when you really get tuned in to, the, to your clarity and your discernment, then everything is so rich. And that's one of them that's mm -hmm. extremely rich. And I've done gatherings literally around the country where we've had video gatherings on that movie. Mm -hmm. and, it's and what it helps a lot, our mind and uh, the spirit, is not to watch trash. And the revision now to gossip. And it's training a lot, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. anything it is a choice. Know. Actually, it's a choice because um, uh, it's a choice, and it's about discipline at home, discipline uh, kids. They want to have kids. Um,